job. And he took me to a strip club and dropped me off and said, you can get a job here. Yeah. Yeah. This one mom, she was very uptight and kind of controlled the whole carpool. But then I said, when she kicked me out, I said, well, can my husband drive? And they said, yes. And I go, oh, so I don't have to wake up in the morning. All right. That's, this will work. Welcome to another episode of Cosmic Chats with Erin Hart. If you got to eat bananas, how would you describe the taste of it to someone who's never had one? I would say that it would be sweet if it was older and mushy, but if it was green, they're bitter and hard to eat, like firm and not the best. So that would be like how you view men, really? Oh. Okay, I guess I like them old and mushy. Fucked <laughs> <laughs> around the edges. <laughs> yeah. Now you uh, have a very interesting life story, but before we get to that, I want to thank everyone who's tuning in and supporting the channel. Please like and subscribe and share. And if you have your own channel that you want to help promote, we want to be part of your community. So just write in the comments that you have subscribed and we'll subscribe back to you. So Erin, I want to hear a little bit about your interesting past, obviously a small town mentality. Within that, with limited uh, people compared to a city, when did you have your first perception change or life crisis as a child? Um, I was in a serious car accident when I was six um, that changed the course of my life. Um, it, it's kind of emotional because my brother died in it mm. and I died for a minute too, but I came back in the ambulance and things I got from that, like I realized when I woke up, I, we had volunteer fire people. So they weren't like, you know, we saw them around town. They would be like, when the siren goes off, the butcher drops everything and runs out the door, the banker, the ice cream people, the gas attendant, you know, they're all volunteer firemen. So this guy that I woke up in the ambulance and he was above me and I thought he had a really sweet face because I guess that, you know, it's the first face you see after you die. And I saw him at the butcher place a lot. And when, when we go to the store and to me, that was, it was weird. It was like, oh, that's that guy. And then the girl that caused the car accident, her dad worked at my school as a janitor and my mom used to always bring it up. And so I would stare at him like, you're the reason like my brother's dead. Like, you know, it's like a kid thinking that. Right. So, so it was really weird. That's why I never wanted to, I didn't want to live there anymore. I'm like, I want out of this small town. I can't stand that everybody looks at me and is like, oh, that's that girl that was in the accident. Oh yeah, yeah, her brother's dead. You know, it was just this whole thing and I hated it. And I had to go live at other people's houses for a while because I, it was my sister and I that were left and my mom was so depressed and my dad was just, he would leave a lot. And I think it was just too much for them. And that was really fun for me, staying at other people's houses, because I got to see how other people lived and all the toys they had. And it was just like cousins and friends. And I really started realizing life is different for everybody. Like we don't, nobody has it the same. Would you say that had you have more compassion for other people? Um, yes and no, because I get really irritated with lazy people. I'm like, come on, like I can do this. You can do this. <laughs> but I, I mean, yes, I, I do. But at the same time, I think my mom's depression, it really started to piss me off throughout my life because she would just always go back to that. And I'm like, come on, you've got to move on. You've got to pick yourself up. And it just became um, something that really dragged her down her entire life. Now being raised by a parent that had 
depression, did you take on a lot of adult roles? Um, my sister, she's three years older. She did. She took on a lot. She was the one that cooked all the time. And, you know, just like she learned my mom's uh, signature really well. So she would write notes if I wanted to skip or things like that. But she also is very responsible and it used to make me angry. So I was like, eh, I couldn't get away with everything I wanted to. But we had to wake ourselves up every morning. And I mean, I'm starting at the age of six and she was nine, but she really made sure I was up then. But then, especially in middle school, I had to come home from school, chop wood because we didn't, it was cold and we didn't have a lot of fuel oil because we don't, it's out in the country. So they, there's a truck that comes and fills up your furnace with oil and then you that's how you have heat in your house except for we had fireplaces or wood burning stoves so i had to go out and use a hatchet every day after school because i was the first one home and i had to make myself snacks and i usually liked like things i'd put in the toaster oven but i would forget about them and start the kitchen on fire i think i did that three times <laughs> so you very much were the byproduct of not only generation x who uh, came home, latchkey kids, but taking on those roles that until you saw other families, you assumed naturally that's how life is for everyone. Mm -hmm. Did you start to get a bit jealous of other people? Oh yeah, especially people with swimming pools. <laughs> I've always wanted a swimming pool. <laughs> mm. So you left Ohio at what age? I was 22 when I left. Yeah. And so you were in, did you find that you were more of an individual that cared not for responsibility or you became more responsible after you left home? Um, I got kind of, I went through a party phase. Well, sometimes I'm still in it, but <laughs> I, I, I moved to Myrtle Beach, South Carolina with the, the first guy that's like, hey, you want to leave here? I'm like, yes, let, let's go. <laughs> and uh, he goes, I have a cousin in Myrtle Beach. I'm like, all right, let's do it. And so I had $300 to my name and we just partied and partied and we stayed in this, got, like slept on the floor of a trailer in the trailer park in South Carolina. And then he turned to me and he, the guy I was with, and he's like, we don't have any money or jobs. I was like, uh oh. So then I had to get a job and he took me to a strip club and dropped me off and said, you can get a job here. I was like, oh, OK, thanks. And so I did. <laughs> and, and did you find you were on automatic? You didn't think too much about what that was. You simply did what was in front of you. Yeah, I always have done basically what's in front of me. And I feel like at 50 now, I'm just waking up like, oh, oh my God, I should have done this at 30. Like, wow. Oh, wow. So I, I feel like I've missed out on a lot of, you know, my youth that way, but I still feel young. So I guess I'll be okay. <laughs> and when you did that profession, what were the aspects you can take away with it that you learned that you were really grateful for? I am so grateful for the confidence I learned. I used to, that's why I was with that guy. He was a horrible guy. And I was every boyfriend pretty much before him was like, like, oh, you've been to jail. Oh, perfect. This is great. <laughs> that kind of guy. And what it taught me is um, boundaries, because if you don't have boundaries as a stripper and you just let them roll over you, you're going to, you're going to die. I mean, it's awful. So I had to learn to say no, like, and set rules and have respect for myself where before I didn't, I, I, I was like a, like a puppy up there. I'm like, ah, wandering around. And I didn't know anything. I had never tried cocaine or anything. And all these girls were doing it. And that was scary to me. And just it was just a whole crazy world that you have to you have to make it or you fail. What was the impetus for you to stop that profession? I knew I wanted out when it was 
like I was team B at that point. I, I had gone through working night shift and being like, you know, the hot one where I just sit there and people come to me and just always getting yeses and yeses for dances. And then going to day shift where the girls are dirtier and things happen in the VIP and I didn't want to do that and feeling like uh, I just don't want to do this anymore. And I just let myself go. I gained a lot of weight at that time and I didn't even get fired for that. I was like, wow, I think subconsciously I was trying to get fat to get fired. <laughs> and it just, ah, get me out of here. <laughs> Attempting to find a way to get to another place. So you you allowed your body to, to gain the weight for that. So you didn't couldn't do that anymore, except they still kept hiring you. Yes. <laughs> I was like, quit it. I don't want to work here. <laughs> and what did you end up doing uh, after that? I went to school to learn to do nails because it was four months long, the schooling. And I used, my grandma and I used to do each other's nails and I'm like, I can do this and I'm good with the art. I love to paint, so. And still to this day, that's a profession that you hold. Yes, yes, I do nails um, here in Orange County. And with uh, your change from being a stripper or an ex stripper, when you tell people, how do you find their perception changes of you? Uh, a lot of my clients, if they were the clients before the pandemic, I had some uppity ones. They have left. It's one thing I'm grateful for, for the pandemic. It's the uppity, uptight people that found out that I used to be a stripper were like, oh, oh, oh my God, are you walking the streets now? I'm like, yes, exactly what I'm doing. That's why I'm filing your nails. I'm like, what? And then I gain these other clients and, and, and the cool clients I have, I say, well, I do comedy. And they're like, oh, what do you talk about? Nails? I go, stripping. And they're like, what? They go, that is fascinating. Why didn't you tell us? That is so great. And so I think it's either or. If you're old school and uppity, then you hate it. <laughs> and if you're open-minded and cool, then it's good. Now, as you've put it into your comedy work, have you found that there has been an inner healing as a result of owning that part of your past publicly on stage? Yes, I, I really feel like it's a it's yeah, because before I was like, oh, I can't talk about it. Oh, I try to hide it. Oh, what if this mom finds out, you know, because my son was in school like, oh, oh. and then my son would get all mom. Ah, people know and that and my husband oh my god the moms found out and they kicked you out of carpool well that's your fault and i uptight uptight now i'm like what Wait, i'm sorry you got kicked out of carpool yes <laughs> okay so how many years had you not been stripping when you got kicked out of carpool i was still stripping at the time oh you were okay so yeah. what did they think you were going to do a lap dance to six year olds? Well, that's what that's a joke I made out of it. I go, what am I going to do? Start stripping for the kids like they don't have money. They don't have dollar bills. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. This one mom, she was very uptight and kind of controlled the whole carpool. But then I said when she kicked me out, I said, well, can my husband drive? And they said yes. And I go, oh, so I don't have to wake up in the morning all right that's this will work it works out for everyone then and let me ask you this if you'd stop stripping at that point did you stop stripping while he was in school and they asked you to go back into carpool and no they didn't they never asked me to come back <laughs> <laughs> so you got excommunicated from some people mm -hmm. and other people and in the between time you you met your husband Oh, we've been together since our son was born or conceived, since we had sex and got pregnant. <laughs> but we moved to California and we didn't have a job or money or anything. And we were 26 at the time with a one year old. And I said, oh, I know how to make money. And then I just it just went from there. And then he had no problem with it. 
Yeah, he has on and off, but he battles with depression. So he would have a job, like lose a job or get laid off. And then it was just up and down, up and down. So I said, oh, I have this, I'll do it. So. And did you find that having had a mother that had depression, you were able to cope better with <laughs> him? I probably have less sympathy for him. <laughs> I told him at one point, I said, look, I grew up with this. I don't want to put up with this any longer. So either snap out of it or get out. I'm not a psychologist. <laughs> <laughs> uh, many people who have had depression, they find that meditation and alternative wellness has helped for yourself with all that you went through. What do you do to help get do to get yourself more centered? I used to have really bad anxiety attacks and I found I did do meditation on and off through that time and that really helped. Exercise has been my biggest help. I do a class called Orange Theory and it kicks my butt and I just, when I run, even though I hate running, hate it, when I do it, it's like I zone out and then I come back and I'm like, whoa, 30 minutes went by. <laughs> But it's almost like a meditation also, I feel. But that has helped with anxiety and stress and all of it. Yes, physical activity is actually imperative for the mind state, especially a walking. They have found really helps because it puts that mind in that different place. And the word meditation can mean so much. It's just given so many terms, such a broad, broad spectrum of that. And those of you who are curious about this form of meditation, we teach. Uh, we teach Vedic meditation and we have a fabulous book called Vedic Meditation Stories. Uh, the image will be on your screen. And that's where we have real stories from individuals that learned the practice and how it changed their lives. People you would not expect to learn this practice of meditation after finding other forms of meditation. So that can be found at Amazon. It's free if you have unlimited Kindle. And I think that now moving forward, what would you recommend to someone who might find themselves lost as you were when you were younger? I did uh, find a girl at the strip club. She was 18 and she was taken from her house from this man and basically her pimp and she called him her boyfriend. And he was doing drugs with her mom and she was 16. Well, fast forward, she's 18 working at the club. And he was a bit abusive, made her go to work, took her money. And I told her, I said, you don't need this. I went through this and you can come home with me. I brought her home, tried to get her away from him. It didn't work, but that's when I called. I, I called my husband, I'm bringing a sex slave home. He's like, what? I go, but not for us. But I tried to help her and just tell her, you have everything you need. You don't need a man to you know, to make money, you make the money. That's the first thing I learned when I broke up with that guy in South Carolina and I was still dancing. I was like, wait, that was my money. This is my apartment. This, everything here I paid for. And I think that's something as a young girl, especially coming out of a crazy home, you don't realize it. it's, you can do it all. You don't need anybody over you. And when you do your comedy, do you feel that's your imparting message apart from making fun of where you're at that other people don't have to go through what you went through? Yeah, I, I guess that is true. I never thought of it like that. I always thought I was, I hated the fact of the uptight people looking down upon strippers because people would say, oh, they're all like whores or sluts or easy or whatever. But I mean, if you work at a restaurant or an office, there's always people like that there too. So working at a strip club, it's basically like a different office. It's just, you have people of all kinds. Like I'm not gonna, when I worked at the strip club, half the time I was married, I'm not gonna go home with a guy and sleep with him. I just wanna make money there. And it's the same. That was always the message I thought with my comedy, but it's true. It, it, it you know, I should talk about that. <laughs> What would you like to leave in this world after your body drops to make it a better place? Oh, in this world, this world's so crazy. Um, 
more trees. <laughs> I like trees and animals. Oxygen is good. It is. We all need it. <laughs> a little bit more oxygen. Well, with this, I hope that you've had a little bit of a lifeline and insight to Erin. Don't forget to like and subscribe to the channel. Please uh, share if you care. Uh, we have the Vedic Meditation Storybook and any events that we have coming up, you'll see it down in the chat. And if you feel like having a yoga class or a uh, workshop on Reiki healing, just check out our live streams. We have all of those there for you for free to be part of the service. And if you want to donate to the nonprofit, all of the links are down there in the chat. And with that, we'll say we'll see you soon on the next Cosmic Chat.